Yep, I think you're live now. Cool. Uh, good morning, everyone. We will start in two, three minutes. Probably we'll give some time for people to to roll in. Chris is saying I'm warbly. Am I still warbly? OK, for me. OK. Yeah, loud, loud and clear here. Why don't you recite a poem for us, Alex, and then we can do a, a longer test. What's that? Recite a poem for us, and then we can do oh, a test. I'll, I'll get my <laughs> book of poetry out. Uh, so for folks just joining in, we're going to start in probably a minute. I'm glad we have more than 250 attendees, so this was all worth it. And I got grief last time for <laughs> teams maxing out at uh, 250. That was cool. I've never maxed out teams before. All right, let's get started. Um, so hello, everyone. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, depending on where you are. Um, we are really excited today to give you an overview of the 0.2 release of uh, BICEP, um, as well as a bunch of other um, important ARM deployment uh, updates on some of the other features besides BICEP that we've been working on. Um, if you don't know me, my name's Alex Frankel. I'm a program manager on the Azure deployments team. Um, I have the honor of presenting all of this fine work, but I haven't done any of it. So uh, <laughs> I thank all the folks here, all of our moderators, all of our engineers, um, the folks that you see responding to you in, in GitHub um, and, and elsewhere. Uh, they're the people that are making all this happen. Um, so with that, uh, let's get started. Uh, please post your questions in the event Q&A and we'll try to answer them as we go. So either we'll answer them, one of the moderators will answer them in the chat, um, or we'll pick kind of logical stopping points to go and, and talk about them uh, more in depth live uh, where it makes sense. So uh, not everyone was on the 0.1 uh, launch call because we couldn't get everyone in. And some people may just be new to BICEP. They, they only heard about it recently. Welcome. Um, uh, if you don't know, Project BICEP is um, a new declarative language for describing and deploying your Azure resources. Um, it, it compiles or transpiles, depending on who you ask, into an ARM template. And basically what that means is you author BICEP code, um, but you run this BICEP builds command to turn it into an ARM template. And then once it's an ARM template, you can deploy it through uh, the means that you're already used to. So you can deploy it through the CLI, you can deploy it through a pipeline, you can what if it, you can deploy it through the portal. It's just a regular ARM template. So just like TypeScript transpiles into JavaScript, BICEP uh, transpiles into ARM templates. And so while sometimes we'll say we're doing a new language, it's really, new syntax of an existing runtime. So the ARM template runtime is not changing. We're just trying to make it easier to, to author. 
Um, just want to go over the goals quickly um, for those that may have not seen this before. Um, our goals are basically to reduce the pain and lower the barrier to entry at the, as our kind of top level goal. So there's a massive amount of usage of ARM templates. It's, it's really quite critical infrastructure at this point. Um, but those of you who have authored ARM templates know that it's certainly really hard to get started. It's a high barrier to entry. And even once you know ARM templates really, really well, there's still a lot of authoring challenges on a day-to-day -day basis. So BICEP principally is, is set up to make that easier. Um, it's a transparent abstraction of Azure, and basically what that means is while the syntax has been changed and, and we're trying to make things easier, we're never going to abstract away fundamental details of the platform. So if a new uh, API version exists or a new resource type exists, you'll be able to use that in BICEP as soon as the API is available. Um, and, and BICEP is modular, and I we said it was modular in the 0.1 release, but we hadn't really gotten to that yet. So in 0.2, we're introducing modules to help you abstract these common blocks of code, um, and we're really excited to see what people do with it. Some non-goals, which can be as important as the goals, um, is we're not trying to come up with one Uber language to replace all the other ways of interacting with Azure. Um, so we want BICEP and the ARM template experience to be as good as it can possibly be, but we actually want all the clients for interfacing to Azure to be as good as, as they can possibly be. We only own one of them, uh, but we have teams at Microsoft, like we have a team dedicated to Terraform, um, we have a team working on, on uh, aspects of the Pulumi provider, and obviously PowerShell, CLI, all the SDKs. Whatever makes you happy deploying to Azure, um, we want you to be using that tool. We just want to make sure BICEP is, is a, a good candidate in the list of options. Uh, BICEP is going to remain a declarative language, so it's not going to turn into a general purpose language for your data processing needs or, or anything like that. Um, it's principally focused on doing declarative deployments to Azure. And then the last one is, you know, uh, we're not out here to just invent new technology for technology's sake. Um, we see a real problem with authoring ARM templates and, and BICEP is, is there to make that as easy as possible. Um, so uh, we got a little bit of grief saying, you know, why are you doing another new language? And, and really, we're just trying to make things easier for this language that already exists. OK, so a little sense of kind of where we're at in the release schedule of BICEP. Um, so in at the end of August, early September, we released the 0.1, which was just like the absolute basics, the primitives of ARM templates, so resources and parameters and outputs and things like that, as well as kind of showing you where we're thinking of how we can make the syntax easier. Um, so better expressions, no, uh, uh, you can do automatic depends on and things like that. Today with 0.2, we're introducing some really kind of awesome, frankly, new features. Um, so we're going to start validating all Azure resource types. So we're able to bring in all the API specifications of all the existing resource types. Um, if you're used to using ARM tools for your ARM templating, ARM template authoring, you're getting some of this today, but we're actually able to go a little bit further with BICEP and we'll show what that means. Um, IntelliSense, um, so we're able to use all these resource type definitions to provide IntelliSense as your authoring, as well as IntelliSense for kind of all the core primitives of, Bi of BICEP and the functions that are available in the ARM runtime. Uh, modules for abstracting code, so you're able to break down code into multiple files, but bring them all together as a as a project. Um, so we'll definitely be demoing that. Um, code formatting snuck into the 0.2 release, so that's a nice quality of life improvement. And then uh, scoping, so the ability to say, I want this BICEP file to target a subscription or a tenant or a resource group, and then be able to control um, for now where modules are deployed, but that will expand out over time. Um, 0.3 is what we're shooting for in, in kind of Jan Feb, um, and that's where we're trying to get to parity with ARM templates and start encouraging more production class usage because you should be able to really do anything that you've done in an ARM template. You should be able to do that in BICEP um, by the time we're at an 0.3 release. The VS Code extension that you had to install manually if you were uh, using the VS Code extension in the 0.1 release is now available in the marketplace. So we have a fancy new logo, so you can love or hate the logo. Feel free to share feedback on that. Um, but it's now really easy to consume. And as a matter of fact, if you open a .bicep file in VS Code, it'll prompt you to search the marketplace for bicep um, extensions that support bicep files, um, and it makes it really easy to install.
if you have an 0.1. whatever version of the extension, uh, you should uninstall it. It won't actually break anything, um, but you might get duplicate errors or inconsistent errors where, where one extension thinks it's an error and the other doesn't. So you should definitely install, uninstall the 0.1 uh, version of the extension if you already have it. OK, so with that, uh, I will spend the rest of the time showing the new features in a uh, demo. Any major questions before I get started? Moderation team. OK, I'm just going to keep going. Uh, let me make this a little bigger. Maybe one more. OK. So I'm going to start by uh, declaring a parameter. So I'm going to follow a little bit of what the tutorial walks through if you've already used that, um, but show how the authoring experience has changed as a result. Um, so I'm going to say param, I'm going to call it a name prefix, and this is going to be a string. And notice I'm already getting some IntelliSense. So it knows the available types that I have. Um, so obviously the, the base types, but also things like secure objects and secure string. These are snippets, so if I wanted a secure string, I could do something like this, and it knows to add secure true um, at the in the parameter modifier section. Um, but I just want a basic um, name prefix, and I want the default value to be an empty string so that it's optional. Now I'm going to uh, declare a resource. So the resource um, is going to be a storage account, so I'm going to give it an identifier of STG, and then as soon as I press space, I see all the available resource types. There are obviously quite a few uh, resource types in Azure. So this is all the resource types, child resource types, all the API versions, everything that exists in the API specification or, or the swaggers that are available for resource types will show up um, in this list. And I can start typing, so I can start typing storage accounts and it's able to search through this list quite quickly so that I can see all the API versions that I have uh, available to me. So it'll put the most recent API version at the top, but if I need an older version for whatever reason, I can do that as well. So I have a preview version here. I can uh, bring this out. Uh, I have a preview version here. I want to pick the most recent stable API version, so I'm going to do 2019.06.01, and then as soon as I add that, it completes the whole string for me, and it knows that I need to declare an object next. So that's uh, what it offers me in IntelliSense. <clears throat> now I'm getting an error on the storage account saying, hey, uh, this resource is missing the following required properties. That's the validation engine uh, and the type system kicking in and comparing uh, the storage account REST specification, what it looks for on a create um, with, with what's uh, listed in this file so far. So I can do IntelliSense right here and everything shows up as expected. So I have the top level properties like name, location, and kind. So I can start typing and let's do, uh, let's use our name prefix and let's add a unique string uh, using the resource groups ID. And then even on the resource group function, I'm getting uh, information about what properties are available uh, as a return type on the resource group function. Um, I'm still missing properties, so I'm still getting that error, which is good. Uh, I need a location, so I'll say the resource groups location. Uh, I need a kind. And for kind, I have a set of enum values. So there's only uh, a set number of values that are uh, appropriate here for this kind property. And of course, it brings all that information in as well. So I'm going to say storage v2. And I need a skew. And notice on skew, I'm getting a warning saying, hey, the, the declaration is missing the required property's name. The reason this is a warning and not an error, <clears throat> even though we're pretty sure this is wrong, um, is because sometimes the swaggers are not correct. Sometimes the REST API specifications are wrong or old or missing a property or what have you. Um, so we're, we're um, keeping them as warnings for now. We'd like to make them errors at some point, but we need to know that the swaggers are 
pretty darn close to 100% accurate. And there's an effort uh, going on right now to make those swaggers as accurate as possible. They're pretty accurate for the most part today, but for now, these are warnings. And so it knows that I have name and tier available to me. Uh, name is required and I get that information right here. Um, and then I have all the, the SKUs that are listed in that API. So these should all look familiar if you've done a storage account before. And so now it's valid. So I'm not getting any errors. There's no squigglies. Um, this is the minimum declaration of a storage account. If I wanted to add properties, uh, Bicep knows about all the properties that are eligible to be uh, used for creation. So these are all the, the put properties of the create or update time properties. So I can go uh, slice through here and pick something that I want. I'm fine doing the kind of default declaration, so I'm going to leave this alone. And then <clears throat> the last uh, cool IntelliSense thing is uh, I'm going to declare an output. So often I'll want to create this storage account and then get, get like the blob endpoint of the storage account. So I'll do um, output uh, uh, blob endpoint, and I'll do st, or, and then I'll do string, and I'll say it's equal to stg, and then I'll do dot, um, just like I'm used to. But now I get IntelliSense for all the um, read-only properties or the get-only properties. So this is a bigger list than what I saw uh, when I did IntelliSense on properties up here, because there are read-only properties that only exist once the resource is created. Um, so I have some here like ID and and kind and and name, um, but I also have um, if I do properties, I can get all the properties of this storage account. So I have, for example, primary endpoints. If you're used to authoring ARM templates and you're used to using uh, ARM tools, this is new. We haven't had this even in ARM tools. We've never had the ability to pull the get properties. Um, so this is a really nice quality of life improvement for exploring what a resource actually has available and what are its types and all that sort of stuff. And so if I do dot one more time, I see all the different endpoints that I can get. So I want the blob endpoint um, and it's actually checking the type. So if I were to change this to int, um, we know that uh, properties.primaryendpoints.blob is a string. And so we can throw an error for that confidently. Um, so I'll make this a string and and leave it there. Um, so basic uh, bicep file, but this um, tooling and this help works for all the resource types. So as, as you get more complex with your bicep files, IntelliSense will be there to support you as you're authoring. Um, there are a bunch of other cool features um, that got included in this release. If I make this really ugly, um, I can just do Alt Shift F now and I get formatting. Uh, I have a lot of like language refactoring features and exploration features like go to def and go to ref, um, rename symbol. So if I wanted to call this my storage, I can rename that symbol and it'll rename all the, the uses of that symbol intelligently. So all these sort of things that we expect from any programming language, we're building those things into BICEP because really BICEP is built in the same way as the most complex programming languages. So we take a lot of cues from TypeScript and C-sharp and all these sort of things. So even though the language might appear simple, there's quite a bit of complexity under the covers to make this all work as well as it's working. So that's a, a main.bicep file. This syntax is not new. So all this stuff was available in the 0.1 release. It's really just showing you the authoring improvements that we have um, for this syntax. But now we will show some new stuff. So I'm going to rename this main bicep file to storage.bicep file. And I'm going to call this new file main.bicep. And what I'm going to do is use a new keyword called module. And a module is a reference to another uh, bicep file, and any bicep file can be a module. So this could have had a million resources. I can call it as a module. This could have no resources. I could call it as a module. It could have parameters or outputs or not. All of that is valid. So modules ha uh, have this keyword of module, of course, and then modules have an identifier just like everything else in bicep. So I'll call this STG mod. And then the, the type in this case is a reference to the file. So I'm just going to do uh, storage.bicep. 
um, we resolve that that path is correct. And now I get a red squiggly because I'm missing some properties. The property I'm missing is name. So let me um, fill in name here and I'm going to call this storage deploy. And that's it. This is a valid module declaration. This name is not our name prefix parameter, um, so that's different. Um, this is a name for uh, this is the name for the uh, uh, nested deployment um, that gets created when you build the file. And let's actually look at that for a second. So this is a valid bicep file. All it has is a module pointing to the file that we just worked on. So let's compile this. Let's do bicep build uh, main.bicep. So I just need to point it to the main file. And that compiles successfully. By the way, I know in advance that it's going to compile successfully because I have no errors. And the compiler code base um, in the BICEP CLI and the language service or the VS Code extension that's running, they are the same code base. So any errors that show up here will show up in the CLI. And if I have no errors, then it'll compile cleanly. And if I go and look at this, I have just one resource here. And it's of type Microsoft.resources slash deployments. If you don't ever want to know about this, you don't have to. But if you want to understand the underlying details, this is what we're actually doing. So we create a nested deployment. Here's that name, storage deploy, um, that we configured in main.bicep. Something called expression evaluation options, which basically just means this is going to deploy the way that we expect it to. Um, you can look up the documentation of what that property is. Um, and then here's our nested deployment. Uh, here's our parameter. Here's our storage account. Um, basically, one module equals one nested deployment, no matter how many resources are, are inside of them. Um, so that lets us have a kind of clean modeling of what's going on inside of the, the JSON file and all the namespacing works out and all that sort of stuff. Um, again, you don't need to care about this, but if you want to care about it, this is what's happening under the covers. Uh, you can be confident that uh, what we build as valid JSON will deploy successfully as you've described it in the BICEP file. So uh, the other thing I have here um, is params. So params are the params that you expose in the BICEP file. And the IntelliSense works here just like it does for resources. So we know that there's a name prefix parameter. It's write only in kind of our the language of our type system. And it's optional. So the reason I didn't get an error is because the parameter is optional. So I can I can say this should be Alex. Um, I can change this to whatever I want. Let me comment this out for a second. And let's get rid of the default value. So the reason it was optional is because it had this default value of an empty string. If I get rid of it, I immediately get a problem. And that's because we're actively looking at all the files and making sure things are still resolving correctly. And immediately the params property is incorrect because it's saying I'm missing this name prefix property. So I can uh, obviously declare that and resolve that error. If I wanted to have uh, like allowed values, so if I do allowed, and I can say Alex and Satya. This is still valid um, because I used Alex before, but now when I do IntelliSense, I get those available properties to me. So these are the things that you know we expected out of any good language. It works uh, really, really well in Bicep. And if I did um, like Marcin here, I get an error because it's not in the list of allowed values. Um, so I'll move it back to Alex. So uh, one thing that, and this is the last new thing, um, one thing that uh, we did in the first release of BICEP is basically assume that all of these BICEP resources were going to be deployed at a storage account. Um, so what that means is we set it up with the resource group level schema and all of our assumptions assume that this is going to be deployed at a, a resource group. But, uh, we so can. Sorry, was there a question that someone wanted to ask? Yeah, um, since you're talking about modules now, I think this is a, a appropriate point for this question. What about the max yeah. template length with modules and nested deployments? So since since we're pulling in modules and compiling this all down to an ARM template, um, is there a potential for a problem with uh, the template, the generated template length? 
there is a potential for that problem. We're not super worried about it right now, and here's why. When we see, so we see that um, length limit every once in a while um, as errors. Usually what is happening is there's a copy or a loop expression in the template that has you know, 400 resources being declared or something to that effect. So what happens is we basically compile that service side and expand it into a very big ARM template. Um, so usually it's not the template length when it's being sent to ARM is, is the problem. It's, it's almost never um, the, the max length. It's when we expand it. Um, and so we do have our eye on like, what are the things that we need to do to make sure that that doesn't happen and what are our kind of escape hatches for those sorts of things? Long story short, we don't think it's going to be a problem in the short term, uh, but we do have our eye on it to make sure it's not a problem in the long term. But good question. Thanks. Any others before I keep going? Yeah, I think the other questions were one was around public modules. When do we think we'll have something around that? And the second uh, question around modules is, can a module contain other modules? Uh, so the second question is easier to answer. Yes, you can call a module that calls a module that calls a module. Um, all that works today. Um, public modules are on our list for 0.3. We're trying to get it in for 0.3. Um, and so it basically you'll be able to reference um, uh, a public module that's in a GitHub repo is likely what we're going to start with. So you just follow the, the, the graph of, of how GitHub is put together. So you can imagine something like um, Azure slash bicep slash VM or something like this or storage. Uh, we don't have the syntax exactly closed, um, but this is the kind of thing that we want to deliver. We know public modules and the ability to share modules is super important. Um, so trying to get that done before before 0.3. Any others? OK. So the last thing is if I don't want to deploy to a resource group. So I may want to deploy this at a subscription and and create a resource group and then deploy this module to this resource group. So let's uh, do that because it's pretty easy. We have another keyword that we're introducing in addition to module. We're introducing something called target scope and you'll get IntelliSense for it just like everything else. Uh, target scope. Um, does what you would expect it to do. It says which scope type are you going to deploy? Is this going to be targeted at a management group, at a resource group, at a subscription, or at a tenant? Those are the four scopes that are available to you in Azure. By default, we assume resource group, and that's why this module is working. But if I change this to subscription, uh, I'm going to get an error. So I'm saying that I'm going to deploy this to a subscription. This error is saying that you need a scope property here. And the reason you need a scope property is because this module is intended to be deployed at a resource group. And we can't deploy a storage account to a subscription. There's no way to do that. Um, so we need to set the scope of this module. Um, before we do that, let's create a resource group because we want to deploy this module into this resource group. So we're going to declare a new resource. We're going to do it from scratch because now it's pretty darn easy. I'm going to search for resource group. I'm going to pick the most recent API version. And the only properties I need are name, and we'll call this 0.2 release. And I need a location. We'll say West US. So now I have a valid resource group, but I still don't have a valid module because I'm missing that scope property. So if I do control space and pull up IntelliSense, I have the scope property available to me. Now, what I do here, and we do have, I can talk about some plans that we have to make this easier, but the way this works right now is we have these functions available already, like resource group and subscription, and we're going to have management group and tenant. If I do resource group um, with an empty parens, I get an error here as well, and it's saying that um, this is not valid uh, in this bicep file because you're going to target a subscription, so there is no default resource group. There's no resource group context to pull from. So what we're doing now is we have the ability to include the name of the resource group as well as the subscription if it's a, a resource group in a different subscription in the resource group function. So this is basically saying deploy this module to this resource group and it's this resource group right here because I'm just pulling the name of the resource group. So just like any other resource I can do RG and then I can uh, pull all the properties 
So I'm just going to do rg.name and now everything resolves. I don't need to declare a dependency because uh, bicep knows there's a reference to this resource group. So the dependency gets determined automatically for me. And now I can just do bicep build main.bicep again. And we can look at what our final uh, JSON looks like. Let's hide this, let's hide this. So now the schema is set up to deploy to a subscription. So before it was just deployment, which is a resource group deployment. I have my resource group, which I just created. I have my nested deployment, same as before. It has a name just like before, except now we've added this resource group property, um, which is what I specified here. It's the name of the resource group. If I needed to target a different uh, subscription, uh, I could add a subscription here and it would add the subscription property here, just like I'm used to uh, with nested deployments. Um, so between target scope and modules, there's a whole nother layer of complexity that you can do with BICEP. Um, anywhere where you've done a linked template or a nested deployment, uh, you should be able to do in BICEP now. So if you run into anything, maybe we missed something. If you run into any issues, um, please do let us know uh, what you're running into in terms of linked templates and modules and things like that. Um, that is everything new, I think. There's there's lots of other like little um, language service features that I'm I'm not going to demo today, but Basically, we're trying to implement everything in the language service specification. So if you're used to it in other languages, you should see a, the same or a similar feature um, in BICEP. So we have an outline view now. The breadcrumbs are working. All those sorts of things are just starting to light up because we basically built the foundation and now we're just plugging the foundation into the language service and, and things just kind of start working. It's a lot harder than that, uh, as Marcin and Anthony are probably screaming right now, but uh, that's basically the idea. I have two, uh, sorry, oh, there were ahead. two questions that came up. Um, one is around, you know, I think if there were a few questions around how is this different from Terraform, uh, in particular around the state management piece. So if you could talk a little bit about that. Uh, and then part two is, you know, I think the, there's a lot of frustration in the people who use ARM templates around staging the, the, the files and templates. And so uh, what are we doing to improve that? Cool. Um, so the first one of, of how is this different than Terraform? So there's definitely, you know, influence of how Terraform describes resources syntax wise. We take influence from, from TypeScript. We've taken some influence from Python in certain cases. Um, so that, that DNA is kind of in there. Um, but the fundamental difference between ARM templates and BICEP and Terraform is, is kind of the way the declarative nature of both of those things work. And what I mean by that is, um, with an ARM template and with BICEP, you're sending Azure the totality of what you want to create. So when you send us an ARM template, we're actually able to look at the whole thing and say, okay, this person wants 50 virtual machines, but he only has quota for 30 cores or 30 virtual machines. Um, so we can tell this person in advance that, hey, this is going to fail halfway through the deployment, so we're not going to start it. Uh, we call that pre-flight or pre-flight validation. Uh, with Terraform, they, their declarative engine is doing everything for you. So it's declarative in the sense that you're saying what you want and Terraform takes care of the how, um, but Terraform is responsible for brokering all the API calls. So there's no mechanism for them to do the equivalent unless they were to implement the, the same logic themselves. Um, so, so that's one of the big differences in experience um, between uh, uh, BICEP and ARM templates and Terraform. And then the other big thing is there's no state file. So we have the luxury of using Azure as the state, basically. It's a multi-billion dollar state machine. Um, so uh, what that means is you just have to give us the file and we're always able to tell you what exists in Azure at this point. So we have a what if capability, so you can take the template and compare it to what is existing. There's no state file to manage or state file requirements to light up, something like that. We're always gonna pull the latest date from Azure. So if changes have happened outside of the BICEP file and someone just futz with something in the portal, um, what if we'll know about all of those, those changes automatically? Uh, and then what was the second question, Satya? Oh, staging, staging. 
So with modules, there is no staging. Um, basically, what we do is we combine it all into one main.json file. So even though we have two .bicep files, we have one .json file. Um, and all that means is you get to send it to Azure in one shot. You don't need to get everything set up in a storage account or a public API, uh, a public URI or anything like that. You just send us this one big JSON file. And that relates back to Steve's earlier question of, are we going to hit the max length of JSON files, which is four uh, of ARM templates, which is four megabytes? I think it's like I did like 40,000 some odd lines and it wasn't even close to one meg. So it's unlikely that you're going to hit that just in the code that you're authoring. Um, so that's that's kind of the, the larger picture there. Any other big questions? OK. I think the other ones are really around um, um, you know, can people use custom scripts with with bicep? Um, does bicep make it easier to read secrets from uh, Azure Key Vault? Um, so a lot of uh, just integration pieces that uh, you know, are we making some of those easier? And the third one being, um, you know, can you deploy a template spec as a module? Um, I think are, are some of the questions that we've got. So let's see. You cannot deploy a template spec as a module yet, but that is something that we would like to, to light up because the scenario is very similar. Um, in terms of authoring like something like a custom script extension or a deployment script resource, nothing changes um, in terms of how that would show up in BICEP. Um, so we have no support for multi-line strings yet. So if you wanted to include the script in line, you'd have to do it in one single line with line breaks, which is a little challenging. Um, but if you wanted to just point to an external URI for a script file, uh, you could do things like that. We do want to have something like, and I'm going to get an error here, obviously, but um, we do want to have something like include file and then point to like my script. Um, and then we would just inject it in the right way, properly escaped and all that. Um, so that's something that we want to do to make some of those things easier. Um, and then I forgot what the, the other question was, Satya. Sorry, I think I had a, <laughs> I lost track of the questions as well, so. Um, oh, Key Vault. So the Key, key Vault's vault. the same story. Um, you still have to link to a parameters file. Um, we want to make that easier. So ideally, there's a, a list secret function um, that we can call on a Key Vault. That API doesn't exist today. We try very hard to get them to work on that API. So one day it'll probably exist. Um, so you'll eventually be able to do uh, KV, if this is a Key Vault, uh, list secret, and then secret name. Um, so you don't need to pass it in in the parameters file. You can just reference it in the bicep file, and this will make things a lot easier. So keep sending them angry emails that you want them to do this. That would be helpful to us. Uh, three more questions for you, dude. One is, what about parameter files? Will bicep support? Will we have a biceptized parameter file? Uh, was one question. Uh, we do want to do that. We don't have that yet. Um, so we want to simplify and, and you know, uh, the same way we did with BICEP, um, do something similar for the parameters file. There's an open issue for that on GitHub if you have ideas for what you want that syntax to look like. We haven't spent any time really thinking about that yet, so I'm totally open to suggestions there. Um, the other one was, there was a question about remote executions. I think that has, uh, you know, more to do with how do we test uh, templates or, or bicep in the future, I, I think is where the, the itch is coming from around that question. Might be. I, it, Terraform does remote execution, so that may also be what it is. Um, basically, you, you need to have the bicep um, binary installed um, to run the bicep CLI. Um, so when, when you're running it in a pipeline or a self-hosted agent or any of that stuff, um, somehow, some way, the bicep CLI needs to be on that machine so that we can convert it into an ARM template and then um, send it off to Azure. Um, as part of our o o 3 plans, we want to integrate the bicep CLI into Azure PowerShell and Azure CLI 
So you don't need to really think about installing that. Um, so if you've installed kubectl uh, through AZCLI, it's a similar integration um, to that where they'll offer to install it for you, um, I believe is what they do, or that's what we're planning to do. Um, and then the, the CLI can just call BICEP and compile and deploy on your behalf. So hopefully you'll be looking at the JSON file less and less and hopefully never uh, going forward. Um, in terms of testing, um, the ARM TTK will still work on the generated JSON file, so uh, that is still a very useful tool. What if is still a very useful tool? Um, and we are thinking uh, more holistically of, of what we want the testing story to look like for BICEP. We had a nice conversation with Steve Murawski, one of our moderators, on what he thinks we should do because he has a lot of experience there. So um, something that's definitely uh, on our short list, but no, no plans as of yet. Alex, what about policy and bicep? So policy and bicep is the same as policy and ARM templates, which means it can be a little janky. And what I mean by that is basically with policy definitions in particular, when you put a policy definition into an ARM template, you're taking the policy definition runtime and language and trying to inject it into an ARM template. And so you have weird issues where you have functions that look the same in both languages, but depending on what runtime evaluates it, you get a different result. And you have to escape out the, um, the, the function so that ARM templates or BICEP doesn't see it. Um, it's the same story. There is a good example um, for creating policy definitions in the examples directory in the BICEP repo that shows you, if you want the policy definition in here, how you escape the, the characters so that everything gets processed correctly. Okay. That's all the BICEP stuff for now. Uh, let me start presenting again. So go try uh, 0.2. It's still very much in that kind of pre-production stage because we're not at parity with ARM templates yet, but it's getting better and better and better. So if it fits your use case, um, please do try it out and let us know what your experience is, what you ran into, all that sort of stuff. Um, so this has all the getting started instructions, installation, tutorial, if you haven't walked through that, uh, pretty helpful tutorial. Um, for ODOT 3, which we're shooting for January, February timeframe, um, this is our short list. Uh, there will be other things, but these are the main ones. Uh, parity with ARM templates is our, our main priority. So things like loops and conditional resources are what we're most focused on, um, as well as making it easier to deploy BICEP files from CLI and PowerShell. So you should be able to say, uh, AZ deployment create and then point it to a BICEP file and not have to worry about uh, how the JSON file gets generated and sent to ARM. You should just point it to a, a BICEP file and then we'll take care of everything for you after that. Um, we have a decompiler that we're working on, uh, so that will help you take your ARM template code and turn it into BICEP code. It'll never be perfect BICEP code, but it'll get you 80% of the way there. Um, and then for the 0.3 release, it'll be supported by, by customer support, by CSS. Um, so once we hit 0.3, you'll be able to open up support cases, um, uh, do troubleshooting with support, all the things that you would expect if you've ever opened a support case for ARM templates or whatever else, you'll get a similar level of support for BICEP at this point. Okay, so I have 17 minutes. I'm going to breeze through um, some other updates for some of the other features that we're working on. Uh, the first one is template specs. So template specs has been in private preview now for a little while. Basically, the idea is you can take your ARM template and store it in Azure, which makes it really easy to share. It lets you R back it like any other resource. Um, you can take your BICEP file, turn it into an ARM template, and then make it available as a template spec. Um, that is now in uh, what I call private public preview. Uh, and basically what that means is we're still technically private preview. Um, so we haven't officially launched as a public preview, but everything's available. So the APIs are now public. The PowerShell commandlets um, are in the latest release. AZCLI commands are in the latest release. And then portal support is now lit up. There's no high key, there's no nothing. So you can use template specs um, just like you would as a public preview. The reason it's not uh, public yet is we're finishing up support uh, for relative path in non-template spec deployments. 
So if you're used to doing linked template deployments and you're used to using that URI function and constructing the relative path, we want you to use the relative path property going forward and we'll do all those kind of syntactic translations for you, even if you have a SAS token. Um, you'll still need to do the staging yourself. So if you want to use link templates, you're not using Bicep yet or whatever it is, um, you will still need to get those linked files into a location that is public. Um, so that's not going to change. It should just be easier to author it because you're going to pass in that SAS token in the commandlet and then we'll shepherd that SAS token around um, for you. You just worry about the relative path. Um, it is supported by CSS now. So if you want to start using it, it's it's fairly low risk to start using it. It does what you would expect it to do. And then obviously all the deployment APIs are GA APIs. So if you deploy a template spec, um, uh, that is all expected to work and, and support it as well. The next one is what if. Um, so this is this is an equivalent of Terraform plan. This is what allows you to take an ARM template and compare it to what's existing um, in Azure. We're trying to go GA in one to two weeks. We're like one deployment away from our GA release. Uh, we have closed about 80 customer reported issues. Um, I think like 30 of them are Stanislav, who's probably on the call with us, so thank you. Um, and thank you to everyone who filed issues, of course. Um, please keep reporting them. Um, so it really does help us. Sometimes our noise reduction efforts will miss something and we thought we, we fixed something and we didn't. So keep those issues coming. They help tremendously. Um, and it's really much easier for me to take a customer reported issue and send it to uh, the, the resource team and say, hey, this customer is experiencing this issue because your swagger is defined incorrectly or whatever it is. So um, I, I encourage you to keep reporting those. Um, we now will show you any resource changes that come from a modify policy. So if you're using a policy with a modify effect to change tags, and I think that they support storage account properties now as well, um, what if we'll know about that? So in the diff and what it's showing you, it'll go and check all the policies and make sure if there are any modifications, it'll show that in the what if uh, response. And then it already works with deny. So if you have a deny policy, what if we'll, we'll say, hey, this is not going to deploy because of this deny policy. The big change and the thing that we've been really working on for GA is uh, putting together a system to make the resource teams responsible for fixing their noise issues. So up until now, we've basically been fixing their issues on their behalf. Um, that is not a sustainable strategy. Um, so what we've done is basically come up with a system to make sure that teams know that there's uh, an issue in their API definition, because that's always what the what if noise issue relates to. Um, there's an issue with their API definition and they need to fix something. And so they're going to have a ticket that gets open and they'll have to resolve it um, much faster than we can resolve it. And so you really should see uh, a significant quality improvement over the next six months. Um, we feel comfortable declaring a GA here, um, even though that you will still see noise issues. So keep keep reporting those noise issues, um, but you'll just keep seeing the, the quality get better and better and better. And the last one is deployment scripts. Um, so deployment scripts allows you to run an arbitrary PowerShell or Bash script to complete the last mile of your template deployment or the first mile or the mile in the middle. I don't care. Um, you can run anything. Um, we're going to go GA in about three to four weeks. And the, B, the big thing that we're um, updating for GA for deployment scripts is the ability to make the managed identity optional. So basically what we're going to do is instead of using the managed identity to create ACI and storage and do the role assignment, which is what we do today, um, we're going to use the principle that's deploying the template. So if I'm deploying the template, I need to have permissions to create ACI and storage, um, but the managed identity does not need to have those permissions. So the managed identity at this point only needs permissions to do whatever the script is going to do in Azure, which means the managed identity can have way lower privileges and it's not as like dangerous of an asset that's kind of hanging out there. Um, if you're not going to do something in Azure, so if you're going to talk to an external system or do some data processing or whatever it is, you can omit the managed identity and we're just going to run a script on a container as if you were running it on your local machine. 
um, you won't be logged into Azure. So if you need to do anything in Azure, you should still use the managed identity or you need to come up with a way to log in on that container. So you could log in with an SPN's credentials uh, if you wanted to do it that way. We added some more retry logic. So <clears throat> some of you uh, got caught by some uh, there, there are back replication issues. Basically, you do a role assignment in one region of Azure and it needs to proliferate to all the regions in Azure. And if you hit the wrong region and the, the timing's off, you can get an a issue there where it thinks there's not a role assignment even though you know that there's a role assignment. Uh, this should happen uh, never. This should not happen anymore. Uh, basically, we have enough retry logic that you just shouldn't be hitting this. Um, the one we get asked for that's not done yet is supporting the ACI to be created in a VNet. Uh, uh, the ACI team is, is building support for that for managed identities so that I can have an ACI log in with the managed identity placed in a VNet. Um, once that's done, we're going to light it up for uh, deployment scripts as well. OK, that right. is everything. We have 10 minutes remaining. If there are any other questions, I'm more than happy to answer those. Alex, I think it'll be good for us to, if you want to copy those links and stick them into the roadmap slide, because I think there were a lot of questions around the roadmap. So maybe people yeah. who joined late that didn't see the roadmap. And, and Alex, uh, we got one question I think will be really good to answer live. Yeah. All right, um, so I'm interested in talking to someone at Microsoft about how my organization's governing and enabling ARM template deployment or uh, ARM development and integrating with Azure DevOps. Uh, yeah, and it's curious if someone at Microsoft would be able to offer perspective on how customers are doing this, point, point me in the right direction. Is there somewhere to watch or is there are there learn modules pointing in this direction or, or where would folks go to look for stuff like that? There, I mean, there is quite a bit of of content on, you know, how to manage ARM templates um, uh, with the learn modules. Uh, uh, Steve um, and Chris and Pierre uh, did a new kind of suite of learn modules that are really, really good. Um, and then there's, you know, there's a ton of content on YouTube for ARM templates. Uh, it's been around for a while, and so people really know how to use them at this point. So I encourage you to check out some of those assets. If none of that is working for you or the documentation sucks for whatever reason, please do email us and let us know. Um, and we're more than happy to jump on a call um, with you and, and learn about your scenarios in depth and, and see what help we can provide you. There's uh, another question, uh, Alex, around, you know, will Blueprints, PowerShell, DSC, script extension, will they take advantage of BICEP? Um, and I think they're all very different in, to a certain extent, so I don't know how we want to break it up and answer that. Yeah, I mean, I'd want to know more about what what the ask is on DSC. If the DSC is to DSC ask is to to look more like Bicep, I, I doubt that that's planned. Um, but if the the ask is to be able to kind of execute DSC on a VM um, with a Bicep reference, uh, we can talk more about that. I mean. There are uh, like VM extensions and things like that for running uh, DSC scripts on a VM, and that still works in Bicep in the same way that it does with with ARM templates. So that that may be possible today. With could the person with, that asked that question actually maybe post another question with more details on that? We'd love to love to understand some more. Uh, Blueprint is not going to take a dependency or, or, or have any kind of first class support for biceps. So you're not going to be able to go to Blueprint and say add an artifact and then select, say select a bicep file. If you want your bicep content in a Blueprint, you'll still have to generate the, uh, the JSON uh, and, then, and then put that into the Blueprint. I think uh, three people asked this question. I think there's a need for doing some sort of timeouts. I guess there's uh, allowing the increase the timeout to greater than 90 minutes. Uh, I think when doing deployments, maybe some resources take a while to create, so people want a, a wait function or something like that to, to do have a delay. Um, it's something we should maybe consider. 
Yeah, so delay is on our list. We know that, you know, even though it shouldn't work this way, the way ARM is put together, sometimes you just need to wait. Like that replication issue can show up in other places. And so we, we do want to add support for an arbitrary, just like wait for, and then you can input the number of seconds that you want to wait. Um, there are timeouts for individual resource creations, and then I think it's a six hour timeout for the ARM template. Um, let us know what what timeouts you're hitting and for what resource types. Um, the timeouts are long enough that you know resources should not be hitting those timeouts. Like there are SQL managed insta instances that I know is pretty offensive in terms of how long it takes to deploy. Um, so it's it's worth having a conversation with those resource teams before we commit to to raising any timeouts or anything like that. There was another question that got a lot of votes with, which is, will BICEP be integrated in Azure DevOps? And again, I'm not quite sure what integrated means. Is it uh, the language or just the BICEP files can be included as part of a pipeline? If it's the latter, uh, you can you can certainly do it today um, just by installing the BICEP CLI with a script in your in your pipeline. Um, there is a couple GitHub actions out there built by the community um, to uh, compile and deploy BICEP files. Um, so you can have like, like a first class experience with um, uh, GitHub actions there. Um, in terms of using the language, that would be cool, um, but there's no, there's no plans to do that. So the, the GitHub action and the DevOps um, syntax will remain YAML um, going forward. Any other big ones? Okay. That's everything we had. Um, we're we're really really excited for you guys to get uh, hands on with with O.2. We're really excited to get O.3 out there and get to parity and start getting people on a on a production basis with Bicep. And then we have a whole bunch of plans for things that we want want to get done uh, after that. Um, <clears throat> so I, I think the big one is is finishing some of those end-to-end -end scenarios. So an Azure deployment is never just infrastructure. Um, VMs have have ways to get um, uh, uh, apps running on the machine. Uh, resource types like websites have that too. You can use containers and things of that nature. Um, but there's nothing, for example, to do like a Kubernetes deployment. So we have some extensibility um, points that we have our eye on to, to really finish out those scenarios, like doing Kubernetes deployments, like creating AAD objects and other things of that nature. So that'll be beyond 0.3, but another uh, thing that we're really excited to get done. Thank you everyone for attending. It looks like we had really good attendance, so that's awesome to, to see. If you have any other follow-up questions, you can reach out to me or anybody else who's uh, on the call. Uh, we love answering questions. You can reach out to us on Twitter, on GitHub. You have our email, um, so whatever works, works for everyone. Thanks, guys. Thanks, everyone. I'm gonna end the... Uh the stream, Alex. Cool.